so I'd like to ask Megan um, to talk to us a little bit about how your research has investigated um, perceptions among Americans and understanding of science in general. And um, I, I'd like you to share some, some of your findings with us. And, and kind of the basis for this is, you know, to communicate to an audience, we really need to understand how to approach them and um, have some understanding of their current science literacy level. So Megan, um, would you want to share some of those statistics with us? Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, I like building off of what Dr. Nixon was just talking about, this issue with communicating science is, is really not new, you know? We've had this going on for quite some time. Um, and I know that statistics can only get us so far. However, I do love statistics. So I'd like to start with just um, some data to kind of set the stage with what we're talking about here. Um, so in most recent survey research, uh, basically we find that roughly one in three Americans or 36% uh, misunderstood the concept of probability. Roughly half the population was unable to provide a correct description of a scientific experiment, and three in four Americans were unable to describe the idea of a scientific study. Yet, public opinion surveys also suggest that significant proportions of the public are really concerned about these kind of low levels of science knowledge. Um, so we have 44% of Americans who think that it's a big problem that people don't understand science in the news. Um, and similarly, uh, a similar proportion of Americans thought that it was a problem that people have um, issues distinguishing between what we would consider kind of high quality and low quality studies. Um, and then finally, we find that um, 92% or quite a few Americans overwhelmingly believe that science creates more opportunities for the next generation. Uh, and then that influences other findings like support for federal government scientific research and uh, general confidence in the scientific community. So all these numbers that I've just kind of thrown at you give us a very clear understanding of where we are at. Basically, um, we know actual science is, is limited. Um, and if you want to go to the, the next slide, um, we know it's important to know uh, and understand science and can continue to fund it. Um, but when we look at where our understanding of science comes from, our formal education is really a, a small slice of our, our lives, you know, uh, through high school or through college or potentially even uh, graduate work. Um, the remainder of our lives studies show that we get the vast majority of our information about science from the media. Um, so once we leave school, um, so communicating science is an incredibly difficult thing to do, but it's, it's really important. So I'm, I'm glad you're all here today and we continue to talk about how to be successful. Um, but one thing I, I want to kind of um, lay out here at the beginning of this conversation is that um, it's not so much that we face a communication challenge, it's a relationship challenge. Um, Scientific training is, is very much uh, emphasizes, you know, uh, objectivity and, and distance from your subject. Uh, yet communication really emphasizes uh, subjectivity and emotional skills. So there's a little bit of, of a contrast that uh, we need to talk about how to overcome. So, thank you. All right, very good. So I put a quote up here. Um, that I don't think most people would disagree with, especially as we're um, watching things happen um, around COVID-19 right now. But Kari, I kind of want to come back to you and talk about addressing doubts and confusion related to science. So we might see two different stories in the press um, and we're not sure how we, um, you know, most, most people maybe aren't sure how to kind of sort through that information. Um, but I, I, so I thought I'd ask what advice you have for us as we prepare to share information with audiences, given that um, science is sometimes debated.
No, Kari, you're muted. Thanks, sorry. Um, I do have some specific tips that I will share um, a bit later on, but since you brought up different, um, different, different representations of science or different recommendations coming up in the media, I think it's a good time for me to mention um, what I've seen most from my work is after the development of germ theory in the 1880s and microbiology, bacteriology, in a society that was already becoming highly secularized, religion was less and less the guiding force for people. What I've seen in my research is that science became the new sort of guiding force of society where people got their information of how they should live and what they should do. So we've come to a place where we have a society now that even today greatly reveres science. And while that's mostly a good thing, in some ways I feel like it's it's outdone itself or confounded its own ends because today what I see in the lay public is that pro-science people, now this is not dealing with the science deniers yet, but pro-science people often valorize science so much in the lay public that they treat it as one omnipresent entity. And this um, goes back to what Megan was saying. Like even people that I think really like science and promote science and wanna do what science recommends, talk about it like it's one, thing with a capital S instead of what it really is, which is many individual humans like you or me um, working with messy data, often at very messy lab benches and debating the results. Uh, this is why, as we all know in academia, this is why we have peer review because even scientists don't always agree with the quality of one another's work and the findings that they draw from that. And so this isn't news to any of us here, but in the lay public, when we see things on social media like science recaps or this week in science, um, I think that's actually promoting a problematic message that makes the science denying community. In fact, I believe that creates the world of science doubters because they say, well, science disagreed with itself. And that for me comes from actually and paradoxically the world of revering science um, that we in the science communication field and as scientists, I think one of the biggest things we can do is try to debunk that sort of legendary status of the, the scientist with one answer or one clear idea of truth and instead talk to them about what our daily life is like, what you're doing at the lab bench, how you've disagreed with other scientists so that we can slowly change the public image of science and scientists and how science is created. Um, that way, when we have people promoting science in the lay public, they're doing it in a way that doesn't sow doubt and skepticism when science has differing views. That's a great point. Thank you so much, Kari. Um, I want to go to Leah now. So Leah, your work, um, and we've talked about it in, in other settings and, and you've described it to me. And I think it's really interesting that the way you look at cultural and socioeconomic impact, um, factors that impact how different audiences receive uh, health information and scientific information. So um, could you talk a little bit about how these character characteristics tend to impact science literacy and how that can um, require us to communicate differently based on the audience that we're uh, working with? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, doctors Nixon and Mackesy have already laid such a great framework for us to think not only about the history of how medicine and science have evolved, but also um, some of the concerns and considerations associated with components like uh, social norms, media literacy, information literacy, and the like. So, you know, when there's a lot of research that has been coming out in the last few decades that stresses the importance of cultural competency as a framework more broadly, but interwoven with that are health literacy and media literacy. So at a starting base level, um, health literacy is ultimately the degree to which we can get access to, process, and then actually understand what we're finding in the media. Now, um, with uh, the prospect of fake news, with the way in which science and um, health sciences are evolving rapidly, we are starting to see now the propensity for individuals to potentially get access to either problematic, inaccurate information, 
or we're starting to see that individuals might not even have access to the information that they might need. So I'm coming at this from a few different levels when we're thinking about um, the digital divide, particularly for um, lower socioeconomic classes or for individuals who live in rural areas and they might not have access to the internet that they may need. But I'm also thinking about this from a cultural perspective as well. And I absolutely don't want to talk about culture from a deficit perspective. Um, and I'm obviously not trying to essentialize any sort of cultural group or cultural background, but um, there can be an extra, an extra added layer um, or an extra barrier whenever the cultural backgrounds of the target audience are not kept in mind. So at a broader framework, um, cultural competency includes cultural belief systems, communication styles, and health information, which all impact health literacy. And culturally, now in this moment, health literacy from a cultural competence perspective is even more necessary, particularly because research overwhelmingly suggests that, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, lower socioeconomic groups have lower levels of health literacy and populations of color also have lower levels of health literacy when compared to their white counterparts. So we're seeing um, larger health disparities here and larger information disparities here, not only in terms of how certain communities get access to the information and then by extension, how they make sense of it. Um, according to the US Department of Health and Human Services, nearly 36% of US adults have low health literacy. And that's I mean, it might seem like a small percentage, but when we think about the entire population of the United States, that is large. And, you know, I think that is even further exacerbated in our, co our current moment, like with COVID, for example, when we saw the evolution of how health sciences was playing out when it came to masks, when it came to respirators and things of that nature, um, you have the evolution of the sciences and the information coupled with the disbelief, the mandates, and the don't tread on me argument, essentially, which is all further sort of exacerbated by cultural backgrounds and cultural belief systems. Can I jump in here, Amy, real quick? Yes, we got a, a question from one of our audience members that kind of relates to this here. Um, asking specifically about how maybe the media or science literacy relates to educational levels of formal education. And then uh, a little further down, a second question about how the paywall of that we put in front of a lot of our scientific journals could be impacting that as well. Okay, so um, any of our panelists uh, that want to address the questions, feel free to. Yeah, well, I think the paywall is um, problematic enough to begin with because then the information becomes kind of insular. Um, but then by extension, um, I'm actually currently working on a few research projects where we're looking at um, pandemic shaming in the media and the ways in which uh, larger American populations are preferring to get information and from where. And this is purely anecdotal from um, the higher education perspective, but I've seen several academics um, and those perhaps with higher levels of formal education relying on the news and the media because it's updating at a faster rate than the information we're finding in the articles. And Megan, I see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I was just gonna say, yes, there's, there's a, a pretty well-established connection between education and, and these various uh, levels of literacy that Dr. Hernandez was talking about. Um, and, and one of the things that I think I mean, yes, there's there's a very large issue with the this paywall and and it, I mean it, it goes both ways where you know I would like all my work to be open and accessible, but then uh, the fees to do that are are pretty pretty large. Um, so so this is is definitely an issue this disconnect between uh, academics and and lay publics at large. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting uh, when we look at COVID is that um, we're really recognizing the potential for, for various spaces for science communication and, and specifically thinking about the, the digital spaces, these virtual connections of previously, well still currently, but a, a lot of science communication happens in locations like 
professional and academic conferences that are really expensive and difficult for people to get to. Um, and so when we're maybe able to recognize the virtual potential of maybe a virtual conference, that may be able to open up doors to people who wouldn't have been able to go previously. So there, there is potential in, in this kind of chaos. Very good. Um, Kari, did you have anything you wanted to add or? Um, in response to that question, the thing I'm just thinking of again is that even those of us, as, as Dr. Hernandez said, you know, even academics I see sharing you know, popular media links um, about COVID. And again, to me, that says that um, regardless of socioeconomic status, we in the Western world feel very entitled to have our science prepackaged and ready-made. We've never had to go through a time where science just didn't know. And we're kind of flailing around like bugs on our backs right now. That, and to me, it just demonstrates how used to um, science having the answers already we've gotten. So, and I don't exclude myself from that. Um, and that is part of the problem that perpetuates, in my opinion, some latent distrust of science because we've always promoted it as, or not promoted it, but we believe that it would always already have the answers for us. That's a very good point. Um, I'm going to skip to the next slide, um, Dr. Hernandez, that you had shared with me. Uh, was there some um, additional um, information you wanted to share with us? I know I had asked you to maybe think about um, how you might expect people to respond to scientific information that isn't necessarily related to health, but I'm not sure that there's often scientific information that doesn't have some health um, aspect to it. So. Um, if you'd like to um, talk any more about the uh, cultural competence and, and uh, health literacy, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of my research on cultural competence, um, understandably so, focuses on health context, particularly in helping um, health promoters, physicians, and clinicians interact more effect effectively with patients of diverse backgrounds. Now, generally, um, cultural competence, I think, in the larger media and the larger mainstream is understood as like a, a short program, right, where you find out a bunch of cultural characteristics about a particular group and then awesome, you're competent. And I think it's important to note a few things about cultural competence. Um, first and foremost, that it is indeed like a spectrum and a long term experience, not necessarily something in the short term. And it encompasses so much more than the cultural knowledge of a particular group. And of course, that is incredibly important, but it's also important to have that coupled with um, our own self and situational awareness as individuals, as risk and science communicators um, about our own biases or beliefs about a particular group, right? So if we're um, disseminating information about AMR or any sort of particular science or health science development, um, it's going to need to be targeted very specifically, not only based upon information literacy and information outlets, but also on the population's um, health literacy levels. It needs to be presented in, an, in a manner that can be understood, but it also needs to be presented in a way that makes sense to that particular cultural group, right? Whether we're thinking about religion as being one of the most salient factors, whether we're thinking about race or ethnicity or even region, which um, is particularly important, I would say currently with health, um, health sciences and just sciences more generally. So the image up here from Butler et al, I think does a really great job at hitting at all of these main points. So it shows that cultural competence is, is is of course one of the most important factors, but it, it's also thinking about culture as underserved or minoritized, right? So we're not just thinking about race or ethnicity, but we're also thinking about other aspects of the population. Um, we're also thinking about health literacy as being a tremendously important factor, and then also cultural targeting, um, which several of us will discuss as the webinar moves on. So in terms of thinking about um, scientific communication and health information, the last point I want to make goes back to Dr. Nixon's point about um, the infringement of civil liberties, right? Because when we think about dissemination of scientific information and health information, it's also good to think about it in terms of risk or crisis, which Dr. Mackesy can also speak to, right? So when, we, when we're disseminating this kind of information, 
something that perhaps may fall to the wayside is thinking about whether or not the population even perceives that they are at risk, right? So there's um, perceived severity, perceived susceptibility. Do they even think that this information is necessary for them? Will it fall on deaf ears? And to what extent do they think they are um, potentially in line to, oh, I don't know, uh, contract COVID, right? So um, yeah, I just wanted to say that as the last point that it's really important to think about the relationship between risk and culture as well, particularly when new developments are coming out. All right, thank you very much. Um, 